And in this video, we are going to be talking, essentially, about understanding the current social order today. And this, uh, this idea revolves around the control of a labor force for produ production, basically. Uh, a lot of people, in, uh, especially in politics, tend to use the word workforce, but really they're just talking about a corporate structure, a system of control, all based around getting, uh, controlling a labor force for production. And we can speculate on what exactly the production component is. Uh, a lot of people might say uh, the gross domestic product, but I think it's something a little different. So the main object of this structure is to keep production going. Anything that is a problem for such a corporate structure would be anything that one either undermines the production schedule, as it were, or, well, or production output, or the effectiveness of the labor force, which of course relates to production. So there are some possible conclusions about what this production is for, but the main idea here is it revolves around the concept of slavery, which is another word for a worker. So the reason why they always say that the 13th Amendment of the Constitution in the United States abolished slavery or freed the slaves, as they say, somehow applying, of course, to the globe, because that is a tagline that's repeated a lot, right? The 13th Amendment freed the slaves, Emancipation Proclamation, all that nonsense. Well, what it really did was it freed up workers for the global system, the global corporate system. The global corporate system, which relies on a labor force globally, of course, for whatever they're producing, they need workers to only be involved in their system and nowhere else, right? So they don't want you working for yourself. They don't want you working for any... If you're not working for the system, then you need to be essentially uh, fixed, either made to work for the system or have something else done. So that's the idea of the 13th Amendment. It essentially meant that you were either going to work for the system voluntarily or you were going to be put into the prison system and work for the system involuntarily. One way or the other, you're working for the system and it doesn't matter. <clears throat> so all international industries are designed to support three specific ones, right? If it's not part of these three, then it's the support structure for those three. And so this might relate to what is actually being produced, what this whole structure is designed to produce. And those three industries are technology, aerospace, and resource extraction. Of course, resource extraction could come down to many things. There's many different types of resources to be extracted. But what we're talking about uh, some of the higher level resources, which usually actually relate to aerospace and technology like silicon or uh, platinum, titanium, all, all the different ingredients and, and resources used to function or to produce things in the aerospace and technology industries. Well, mainly only those three have actual advancements. Of course, as technology goes, most are focused on the drone aspect of technology, less so much on, say, communications. But out of all the industries, technology, aerospace, and the extraction of resources are pretty much the only ones that actually continue to advance. Everything else is simply to support them and their production. So these can, of course, be broken down further uh, into subset categories and within these industries there's of course priorities uh, where production of a, a certain or extraction of a certain resource is required or desired above all other ones and naturally this comes through incentivization and if you think about it from the terms of the labor force 
the people who get paid the most are the ones who extract the most valuable resources, work on rockets, or are doing something, some control mechanism within the technology industry to leverage new innovation and whatnot. Obviously not for the labor force, right? This stuff is not designed for everyone else's benefit. It's highly controlled. It's kept at an elevated state. And so that's why you have people asking questions like, why is, why is all of a certain resource being extracted? Why is so much being invested in this resource, which appears to have absolutely no benefit for everyone, on the, everyone else on the planet? It's simply getting funneled up to some source, and we don't know where it goes after that. You see a lot of that happening, especially when it comes to silver and some other commodities like that, where there's a whole boatload of it being extracted and just essentially disappearing, right? Where does it go? So um, the idea here is that it's, the evidence would suggest anyway, that all this production is designed as some sort of armament and refueling station for, say, galactic travel, spaceships, stuff like that. And that's a logical conclusion anyway. Of course, there's many other possible ones. That's maybe more so today a conclusion that a lot of people would come to with less ridicule than maybe in the past. But either way, it's even though it is a conclusion that it seems like the system and the people in the system would not want you to come to, it doesn't necessarily mean it's the only one, right? So as we're talking about the control of the labor force and the fact that most of us are involved in this labor force and to guard against disruption, we should also understand essentially how this thing functions. First, we have international and subnational Revolving funds, which are used to sub subsidize the components of the system. So if you think about a, um, an investment fund in which you have multiple uh, uh, streams of flow, right? You have multiple ways in which funds and things go into this singular fund. A revolving fund is what it's usually called. And then those groups that fill into it, other groups can pull out from it. That's sort of how it works. And when you want something to be done, you use these general funds as an incentivization mechanism. You incentivize what you want done and you decentivize what you don't. It's the same idea as essentially in a conflict, you backing the side that you want to win, the one that will do the most for you. That's sort of the idea here. That's how that works. And there's a lot of streams that go into these revolving funds. There's the uh, so-called tax schemes, right? Taxing a, a like driving, uh, sales tax, income tax, all of those are sources that go into the stream and continue these revolving funds and then they come out on some other end, possibly on a different side of the planet from where the original source came from. And that's sort of how the structure works. It's like putting grease on the gears of any machine. So naturally, the primary leash used on the labor force is going to be financial, if you're considering the general fund concept. So if somebody is um, a better element in the labor force as the system sees it, which of course would be anyone that does their utmost for the corporation, because it's all about the corporation, and that's it, right? The labor force is, is not considered anything but a component of the corporation. It's a uh, uh, um, in many ways an inhuman entity and so this global corporation they use the leash of funding so if uh, if they want somebody to do something they will put a leash on them say grants are the most obvious example of this where you dole out money from these general funds which was taken from one place say uh, taxes theft you know whatever you want to call it and then it's given to somebody else, but that person's required to do all of this stuff for it. And if they don't do it, then it gets pulled away. That's a leash, that's a financial leash. There's other ways that this is done. And in fact, in most contexts, every single financial scheme in, up to and including the currency itself, so-called, is a financial leash. If you don't do, if you don't 
uh, continue to operate as a component of the labor force, then you essentially get the yeet leash yanked on you, right? You get threat of poverty, just living on the street. You know, all those things are, are used to threaten people who do not toe the line, who are not um, willingly enslaved. Now, of course, if uh, if with nothing else left, they'll figure try to put you in prison, if uh, you're compliant, of course, uh, to get you to work involuntarily. It's all about continuing production and leveraging the labor force. But the, obviously the primary and most effective leash is going to be financial. Uh, choice does not factor in here. It's, it's just like any corporation's view of employees. There's no choice, okay? You are either work for the system or you work for the system, and that's it, period, right? There's no choice in it. So everything is views, viewed through the lens of the corporation's equity. The easiest way to see that is how uh, municipal corporations will borrow on future revenue of the residents. Well, this to them is not a problem because the residents and everything within the municipal corporation's territory is equity of that corporation. They can borrow against it. They can do whatever they want with the equity in the areas. That's how, how the corporation sees it. That's how the global corporation sees it as well. Municipal corporations and so-called state governments and federal governments, whatever you want to call them, across the planet, they are all subsidiaries of this essentially global corporation system. And it's all about equity. And the worst part, of course, is that humans and the labor force are all considered equity in the system. Everyone in the labor force, all the components, all the land, absolutely everything is all equity of this corporation, and it is all seen through that lens. So essentially, if it doesn't serve the corporation, then it's a uh, it's it's a liability. Now, this global corporate environment control structure of which the primary components are naturally going to be the uh, labor force and equity, of which, of course, the labor force is considered a component of the equity, but equity also does include uh, resources, land, things like that. Well, the environment in every control structure, and this is the main reason why you see the same patterns with very little distinction across uh, corporate structures such as banks, uh, just a regular business that does canning maybe, or uh, the so-called government, right? They, they all run things in, a, 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 in such a similar way that it's basically just a copy of the same thing with a different name. And that is the system of data metrics or measuring through data. Metric is uh, the word for measuring. It, we, are, we have, of course, the metric system, which gets repeated a lot, but that word comes from the idea of measurement, such as in Spanish, you've got medir, it's to, to measure. And so a data metric is a measurement based off of information. And the labor force specifically, as well as all the other equity things, if you think about, say, a balance sheet that an investment portfolio might have, well, Everyone and in this system, which is just about everyone on the globe, are all incorporated into the data metrics. Even if you're not a participant, of which few people are a participant in the labor force, most people are participants in the labor force. Uh, there's few people that aren't, such as with you might have some uh, Indian groups here or there who could be considered not part of the labor force, but that's very rare. And most of those are treated as uh, future labor force components to be acquired, essentially. So if you're, even if you're not involved, which most people are, then you're still going to be included in these data metrics, right? They're, they have all these different ways of gathering data for their metrics. And these could be, with, most people, I would say, are familiar with data metrics, but perhaps not to the extent of how it's done everywhere. 
such as you could have the census population in an area and then you compare that to the percentage of revenue coming out of there and if the revenue does not match the population then there's something going on there right uh, and it's the same thing with uh, school attendance the people in the population should have this number of children in the schools and if uh, if there's not enough children in the schools to match the population then they have a problem there there there's all sorts of different metrics for data and all of this do is done in the most inhuman way possible what I mean by that is that if a human was were, was doing that they would look at ways that they could essentially try to benefit the other people. That's not the way this thing looks. It's simply the cold calculating perception of a company. Humans are not seen as anything beyond equity and a labor force. And if an area is not producing like it should be, then that's a problem for the company. And that's mainly the only objective for all of this data gathering. In that cis type of system, all the data metrics essentially are used to ensure that the labor force stays on production or else, essentially. And of course, naturally, that no, no places will rebel, as it were, against the system by uh, failing to produce for the company. It's just like you have uh, annual reviews in a corporation for a particular department and those people that come up on the the metrics that's what determines bonuses and things like that and this is the same way that the system works for elevation and demotion of members and it's done through data of course there's another component which is the one that people talk about but usually not on any controlled platforms and that that, that is being put on a list the watch lists or black lists. So the judgments are made based off of recorded data. And that's the same thing with the equity courts or the banking courts that we call uh, judicial courts today, where the decisions they make is always going to be based off of a file, right? Paperwork. It's not necessarily wrong to use paperwork as evidence, but Pretty much they only use it as that because this is all how the corporate system works. Of course, it could be online, but it's still basically the same thing. Generally, if it's going to be word of mouth or something like that, then it has to be included into some paper format, reduced to writing. But this all has to do with this control structure. So the development of an area so when people talk about a third world country or an underdeveloped country, what they're actually talking about is that the area is not fully developed for the benefit of the corporation. The corporation is not reaping the mass, the, the most amount of product that it can squeeze out of the area that, that could be taken, basically. That's what it means by underdeveloped. It is not being fully leveraged as far as the data metrics go for the benefit of the company. And in this context, everyone in the labor force essentially rats on everyone else by filling out forms. Whenever you fill out a form, it doesn't matter what form that is, you are providing information and data, which then goes into these databases and is leveraged essentially against possibly even yourself. And you wouldn't even know that you're filling out data that is going to damage you in this, in this system. The, the next component, of course, to keep this labor force under control, other than the financial leash, right, threatening livelihood is the first, usually the first step to get uh, uh, to keep uh, control on a labor force. Uh, prison, right? Be they're never going to threaten death because if it, it's like if you have a cow and you don't want to kill that cow unless you're going to sell its meat. Usually you want the cow, especially if it's a dairy cow, to keep producing milk and to um, produce maybe uh, fertilizer for plants. So you, you don't want to kill it, especially if it's, if it's not a beef cow. But you want it to keep producing. And so when it comes to the labor force system, either you're going to produce of your own volition or you're going to do it involuntarily in the prison system. That's how it works. 
So the other way is to, to ensure that it doesn't get to that point where you have to use your leash. As far as the corporate structure works, it's better to make sure that people don't think they're part of the labor force where they're producing something for someone else's benefit. You want them to be docile, right? Just like, uh, just like a cow, right? You want your cow to be happy, you want to keep producing milk and not be the wiser that you're taking essentially everything. Because this is a little bit different because if you're farming a cow, you are um, providing possibly milk to a, a baby cow who's gonna grow up and then be a benefit in the future. And, and you're sort of balancing that. Well, that's not exactly how this structure works but it is to an extent, I suppose. But either way, it's all about control and, and ensuring that the labor force continues working. So the elaboration of falsehoods and keeping the labor force ignorant, that's a primary component to ensure production continues. We can see that very obviously today with all the political systems. The political systems are public theater. They're designed to keep the attention of the labor force distracted just enough that they think they're doing something and they think they're involved in something and their attention is held in that. And so they're, they're focused on something else while they're producing. And they don't realize that all their production is not for them. They're slaves to someone else. And slaves meaning worker, but they're involuntary workers, essentially. They are being tricked into doing this stuff and they've been uh, schooled in the school system to be worker drones for the system. And so the perpetuation of these falsehoods is very important to keeping the population docile. So if you think about if you're, say, from a different planet and you're going across, traveling across Earth and you see all of these continuous loopy TV shows and television sh shows like you go into, say, a gym and you have all these TV screens and then they're all blasting stuff. Well, you wouldn't pay attention to that stuff because you understand that all of that is to keep the labor force happy and ignorant. Or maybe not happy, but at least ignorant. Because <laughs> especially nowadays, most of that stuff does not keep anyone happy. So if it's not producing for whatever purpose the production is made, then it is a support system and the production is designed to maintain the system. And this is the same with falsehoods. You can see that with tourism. There's many examples of this. Uh, it's very obvious in Rome where you have all these backstories about how Rome is the center of everything and the first of everything. And when you go there, you get charged for pretty much everything, right? You get charged to take pictures. You get charged to go to places. You can't cut this far, this close to things. And of course you find that everywhere, but that is essentially the idea. If you create a falsehood, a backstory, some sort of uh, reason to get people to come and see a monument and then you charge them for that, well, then you have essentially instituted falsehood for the purpose of extraction. And when you're talking about a system where they dole out essentially a, a, a it's all done through data metrics. So people's salaries are determined based off of the data metric. And then all of these ways that they then extract little bits and pieces from your salary ensures that you continue working, you continue being a component of the labor force. It's like if you gave somebody a collection of apples and then you kept taking little pieces of each apple until eventually they had to come and ask you for more apples, right? That's the idea. So you have all of these schemes and all these mechanisms to which all the, the continuous microtransactions is what it's usually called with video games, the continuous microtransactions of life where you travel somewhere and you get charged as soon as you step foot on, well, as soon as you're born basically, you are, somebody is being charged. That's how the system works, of course. And so whatever you make, it's going to get sucked away so that you have to continue producing whatever it is that you're supposed to be producing in the system. Now, adherence to this system is expected. It's 
not really. It's it's just like any corporation. There's no concept of choice there. You have a job to do, do your job, basically, right? That's the only purpose that you have, is to do your job. Whenever you get hired into a company, they will always say, do your job, it's what you're hired to do, right? Well, your purpose in life is to serve the company. That is the perspective. But so, if, but if you wanna get promoted, right, just like any corporation, it is not about merit. It's not about producing well or doing a good job. It's the showiness, the, the show of obedience to the system, usually demonstrated out of the desire to whip others, be someone else's whipping boss, right? Going around and badgering and harassing somebody and trying to get them to do something in an open manner. That shows that somebody will essentially sell out their colleagues for uh, promotion and gain, and that's exactly the type of individual that this type of system wants to promote. Not somebody produces a lot. If somebody produces a lot, they should be kept in that position and try and try and produce more. And so if you can find a whipping boss can, that can motivate them, right? There's their, their lovely word they like to use a lot, motivate. If they can find a whipping boss, they'll motivate them. Then you want to promote that person over them. And so that's the reason, which is funny because in this, in that type of context, you don't really comprehend, the, the corporation, corporate system cannot comprehend the drawback to that, doing that, is that because in that system, everyone's going to produce always, all the time, there's no choice about it. So you don't really care about the opinions of somebody who got passed over on promotion by somebody they hate, basically. Now, the other way, and perhaps the less likely, but still happens a lot, is promotion of somebody who motivates through fraud, subterfuge, essentially trying to trick somebody, and it, to uh, for whatever reason, right? Personal gain, it doesn't matter. If you sh openly show your desire to trick other people into doing something, then you could also be promoted in the system to essentially get others to produce more. That's the idea. So that's the only way to get get promoted in this system. It's not about merit. It's not about capability. It's only about obedience to the system and beyond that, try to force others to produce more. Now the next component are the enemies or what you would see say as targets of the system when you get identified as a detractor probably not an enemy because this type of corporate structure doesn't like to use terms like that you know if you think about it in a corporate context they always try to use uh, uh, very mundane and vague terms but that's really what they mean is enemy or target so when you're thinking about who might be those logically there's two ways you can get identified which then of course means you're gonna get put on a list or a data metric. The first and most common is through activities that appear on data metrics. This could come easily, as we know in the school system, this could come in the form of an unruly child who simply will not conform to quote unquote authority. So they love to use that word all the time. Someone who will absolutely not conform to the system and refuses to produce that comes across on the data metric, that person's gonna be on a list. If it's from the school system or when they're born, it's gonna be on a list from the get-go. Later though, somebody might start showing a propensity to detract from the system, to go a different way or whatever, and those activities might get them on a list. Something as simple as gardening could get pop up in data metrics, and a lot of this stuff might have analysts looking at them just going through as, as mundane corporate drones and reporting on these things to put, you know, elements from a particular uh, household or whatnot onto these lists. It could also be automated, right? Could be a computer program doing it. And so the second way that you can get put on these lists, which is perhaps the less least common, is through overt declaration of opposition to the system. 
And that usually comes in the form of specifically declaring and doing something in a public manner which gains enough attention to be put on a list by targeting essentially their labor force or production in some way. If you just go out there and and, uh, and make a lot of noise, you might get put on a list, but you're not going to be that big of a deal, as far as the system is concerned anyway. And that gets into the three types of lists that you might be put on. One, The first one would be somebody who's troublesome or essentially engaged in activities that might damage workforce compliance. The effect on production, of course, being there. Not necessarily that you succeeded, just that you engaged in things like that. And that could be something as simple as... Uh, making a class on backyard gardening, right? That would uh, possibly damage, it, it's hard to say, it, it depends on how you did it, but if you were trying to get people to essentially produce for themselves, then you would be engaging in an activity that could damage uh, production of the, or output from the workforce compliance. The next one would be worrisome, and that's when you have had some success in subverting workforce compliance or production you've actually been able to do it to some extent not necessarily you've been successful completely just you have had some some success and so you you're worrisome you're you're a worry now outright disruptive and the reason why i use this word is because it's their word the worst sin that you could do in this system is disruption you learn that first and foremost in the school system. When you're disrupting class, it's go to the principal's office, right? And if you disrupt the class three times, it's three strikes and you're out, you go, you get nasty stuff happen to you in the school system for that. Bathroom privilege is revoked, you get sent to um, detention, you get sent uh, out of school suspension. The worst thing you can do is disrupting class and that's uh, usually, of course, what you would probably see on most uh, disciplinary data metrics from that system is disruption. So you learn at an early age that you don't disrupt the system. That's the worst thing you can do. If you do bad stuff, they can let it slide as long as it does not disrupt others, right? So that's their, their big word there. Disruption of the labor force naturally will affect production output, and that will pop up in data metrics. Now the consequent, possible anyway, possible consequences of being on one of these lists will have to do with a financial leash. That usually is seen through in the corporate eye as the revocation of benefits and privileges afforded by the system. So they extract all this stuff from you and then they dole it out with leashes with strings attached and if you don't comply they pull it, right? Well, that's when you get on a list you get that stuff pulled. Everywhere you go, they're going to stonewall you. They're not going to process your paperwork. They're going to, all of these things are going to surmount to, and you get denied for a lot of stuff with, with just some offhanded, stupid explanation. And all of it just boils down to you're on a list somewhere and they are drones processing your paperwork and your stuff and it just comes back. You, you can't do anything about it, right? You're on a list. So it's all corporate. All the government programs are all corporate. You are supposed to continue producing, continue being a component of the labor force, and if you refuse to do that, then you get essentially all your corporate privileges revoked. It's just like if you're in a, in a job and you refuse to do something in that job, well, then what do they do? They revoke your access. You can't get into the building anymore. You uh, get your salary cut, right? All this stuff just happens and you can't do anything about it. That is how the global corporate structure works our pretend governments are all corporate. They're all a part of that. They all run exactly like any canning factory would. Doesn't matter. Or McDonald's, Walmart, whatever. They're all corporate. And uh, also, as I, I suggested before, right, in the school system, when you don't fall, toe the line or follow along, you learn to understand that benefits will be revoked the benefit of using the bathroom is a big one, right? That That's something that uh, still goes on today because the school systems will do whatever they want. Their entire purpose is to train from an early age compliance in the labor force. And the other thing, of course, that 
we haven't exactly seen well some leashes are not going to be invoked because of the effect it will have on the labor force in the system and the production. One of those, of course, will be driving privileges. So naturally, if you're running the system and you're looking at the data metrics, you would want to use different control mechanisms in different areas, not necessarily all areas using the same one because that's going to in impact your production your, your, and your compliance in the labor force. But revocation of driving privileges is something that was used in, say, Akron, Ohio, to as a, a force mechanism against those who were not paying their fair share as so far as the corporation sees in regard to property taxes. People who are outright flat refused to pay their property taxes would have their driving privileges revoked. And then, of course, that's enforced under arms with the uh, police for the so-called law enforcement, which is the law of the corporation. That's the law enforcement. Not the law of the people, it's the law of the corporation. So, uh, re revocation of privileges, of course, and funding, benefits, all that stuff. It's just, if you're, on the, if you're on the real bad juju list, not only do you have everything revoked, but they actively try and shut you down. They actively try and corral you to limit your impact. That's the thing. If you're a problem, then they might not outright try and kill you. They probably will but they're at least going to try and limit your impact on the labor force and on the production, whatever you do that might damage their system. So, um, as an example, when I was going to the University of Nebraska Kearney, I looked up the bylaws of the Nebraska system. And in the bylaws, it has things like treat others with respect. Well, all of them went up to the point of disrupting class. That was the worst thing you can do as far as there there would go or anything that disrupts the the school system, the function of the school structure, right? That's the worst thing. Any faculty member, anyone at all who disrupts the system is guilty of the most heinous crime as far as those bylaws were concerned. And I did a, a video about that before. And in that corporate structure just as like any the only types of change you're ever going to have in the corporate structure is when components need to be moved out. So like so people get too old and they need to change them with someone else. Like managers, uh, the whipping bosses, right? Uh, what I mean is you have upper level management and they sit behind desks and they don't really go out and talk to anyone and they might have, and the lackey they have, that's your whipping boss. That's the one that goes down into so-called operations and then yells and screams at people and tries to... Uh, uh, cajole them, beat them into submission, whatever, threaten them with being fired, all that stuff. That's your whipping boss. They usually serve uh, at the pleasure of a upper level manager who then is in uh, a rung above involved in the corporate ladders. And that's the same structure everywhere. So you could have a change out of the functions or the system right you you have something that has been rendered obsolete and so they need to change the system or function to uh shift over to it incentivizing a different production scheme things like that so those are those are things where you see changes uh f changes in forms formulations right the paperwork how it's designed set up all that stuff could be because the manager has been changed somebody came in and they just want something slightly different and tech Technology, right? You have different changes in technology, of different changes in, say, celebrities, the different faces that might do something. Because, of course, if you had the same person who was running the same thing for a hundred years, well, that will get suspicious, right? Somebody doesn't age after a hundred years. That's strange. So naturally, they have to change out the celebrities, the faces, and this, of course, includes politicians. They're the faces who are propagandists designed to keep the labor force. Uh, they keep the labor force's attention so that they continue producing and they're completely docile and ignorant. And then uh, that, of course, has to do with distractions, such as with uh, amusement parks, uh, things like that. You, according to data metrics, you might need more amusement in a certain area to keep people distracted because they're detracting from the system. Or you might need less because there's too much distraction and there's not enough production going on. So there's always a balance, and that's how these data metrics work. And 
it's completely hands off, all on paper. There's no human interface, nothing like that. And it's yeah, it all comes down to labor force production. So those are the only changes that you ever see. They only ever relate to the control of the corporation. And that's the reason why you see a continuous amount of no change, really, simply changing faces, two, two faces of the same coin when it comes to politics, all these promises, all this stuff, and nothing ever gets done. Well, that's, of course, not just because they're celebrities and their public relations and their distraction, but it's the same thing in the mechanism itself is that you can change out any director, any head of a department. It doesn't matter. The system will continue running because it's not about individuals. It's only about the corporation. So, of course, naturally, uh, this system requires strict adherence to permission or requests. All the different permits and licensing and orders, all of those things, they all come down to the fact that if you want something done, then you have to jump through a bunch of hoops. You have to get all these permissions, all these check in the boxes. Uh, this is no different in the military or any of these other places, despite the fact that there is a promoted desire for initiative. There is not. Initiative is by and large penalized. Initiative, personal initiative especially, is a problem for this system. So when we look at, at this, this concept, a, a good way to understand this corporate structure, how it works, is from the school's definition of culture. And the school's definition of culture is the same one that we find in Google and modern uh, revised dictionaries, and it's basically just broadcasted everywhere. This is culture. And that's because it's coming from the corporate perspective. And it states that culture is not a property of an individual, but the collective group. What they mean by that is just like in a corporation, the culture of the corporation is not owned by the employees, it is owned by the corporation. And if those employees leave and go to a different corporation, then they're introducing themselves and must conform to the new culture of that corporation. That is the corporate definition of culture. And that's about the only definition of culture that you see today, unless you have some sort of physical copy of a dictionary that's really old. Because this corporation's been around for a while, and we only ever pretty much get that perspective, which is that all things are property of the corporation, including culture. It's the corporate culture. And then this gets us into the idea of the atom, or Adam. Adam from the Bible relates to atom, A-T-O-M, from Greek, which means individual. So you, this is a different, because when if you were to look up fear of an individual, it would give you anthropophobia. That's actually f fear of anthropom anthropomorphization. So somebody who's afraid of a, a phobia being fear, or phobos, Somebody who's afraid of a teddy bear coming to life, such as with the Chucky doll, from that's anthropomorphobia. That's not the same thing as fear of an individual, though. But that's what you get if you Google it. Fear of an individual would be atomphobia or atomophobia. Atomic, right? That's where we get the word atomic. Like atomic bombs, atomic warfare, things like that. Now, there's a video game called Star Citizen. And in this video game... You have a planet which provides fuel and weapons. It's run by a corporation. This entire planet is leveraged by this corporation to arm and refuel spaceships. And the population is uh, essentially, if you're a visiting individual from uh, out of off planet, right? You're you can go anywhere, you can buy anything, you can do business, whatever, as long as you do not damage the corporation's control over the native population because the native population is the labor force that produces the fuel and the weapons that are sold by the corporation. So basically that's how you en end up uh, being prohibited from, or possibly killed for, and, and not allowed to come back to that planet. Anyway, that's how it works in that video game. That's a, a an example that's applicable to what we're talking about here. That's essentially how Earth is right now. You're either a component of the labor force or you're a component of the labor force. 
if you're a problematic component of the labor force, then you are written off as a liability and co corralled into an area out of the hope that eventually you might become an asset again. And then when we look at when we look at this, a person should understand that if you want to do something about this, you're going to be at war with the system, which will be a little bit different than war with an individual. It's a little bit tricky because you would be an individual at war with a system, essentially, like with, with the Matrix, right? But if it's war between an individual, it's atomic, naturally. It's atomic warfare is individualized warfare. However, when it's war between a system or groups, then it's political. So when it comes to the concept of political, which uh, apparently we get from the word polis, Greek for many, or poly, meaning many, like a polyglot, polygon, uh, many different uses of that prefix poly. Well, that's, of course, where the word political comes from. And so naturally, when there's many involved, it's a political war. And also, of course, that's where the, we get the, the French police or policy and police, of course, or police, you know, as we say, or policy, corporate policy, corporate police. So if you look these things up on Google, it will define these things in the context of a conflict. However, war and conflict are very different. Conflict is a broad term. And it's generally used to denote a disagreement, which varies in intensity and entrenchment. Somebody could have a mild disagreement anywhere about anything. You could have a disagreement about who was first at the gas pump. You could have a disagreement who was first in the line. Most of those things are usually held, uh, done, uh, uh, solved amicably without much conflict uh, or without much um, further conflict anyway. Because the, the conflict is, is just a general term that could be something completely insignificant or something really big, right? It's, it's just it's a term that applies to many things. War is different. It implies the commitment to contest. When you have no other recourse but to enforce contest, you have essentially two sides so entrenched in what they're doing that they've resolved that the only way to fix it is through a contest. Of course, you can have uh, different types of uh, wars which do not involve violence in, in their, their contest, but you could have, of course, things that are designed, decided through contest, and that's actually war. Now, of course, somebody might dumb that down into saying, oh, well, you could have, um, a, um, ha have that involving pranks. Well, generally that is referred to as a prank war, right? When when you have escalation of pranking each other, they usually call that a prank war. And that gives you an understanding and use and custom and history and practice, all of the, all of the, uh, the checks, as it were, for definition. That is what war means. It is resolved to contest. So there's a different, couple different types of wars which you'll never learn about in the corporate control structure. The first of those would be testing wars, of which I would say most wars are testing wars. These wars are instigated between two sides to test in the field arms. It's not a testing of strength or a testing of another side. There is no actual entrenched contest where something needs to be decided. It is simply a war that's instigated under whatever pretext, but with the actual design of testing weaponry, communication systems, missiles, whatever it is, they're rolling this stuff out to test it in the field so they need a, naturally, a place to do that. And most of the modern wars today are testing grounds for arsenals and arms, with possible other implications as well. 
So that gets us, of course, into acquisition wars. Now, of course, you can have a mixture. You can have these labels could be applied to more than one war. But then you have an acquisition war, and that's designed to take something, to acquire something. If you had a bet or a betting war or a prank war, those could be acquisition wars between individuals. You know, acquiring something as simple as uh, the right to, between guys, the right to ask a girl out, or um, between girls, the, uh, you know, that stupid nonsense <clears throat> from high school. Either way, those are essentially individual wars. It's a little bit weird, though, when you think about an individual going to war against the system. Either way, that's what you would have to do if you do not agree with this imposed control structure. Total war is something that the system does not like or want because it means destruction of its equity as the corporation sees it. Total war is the complete eradication and only ever ends when either one side's completely destroyed or both are. That's total war. You don't usually see that a lot. But if you are against this system, then you essentially have to engage in total war with it because there's no other possible outcome. If, if you're against the corporate control structure system, then you have no other choice than, than to face it in a total, total war scenario. There's no rules except, of course, for the natural ones, the inherent rules of uh, superior force, things like that, right? Um, effective measures. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it only ends when one side or the other is destroyed or both. Now, bluffing wars, that takes place when you want to determine the strength of an enemy or you simply want to uh, make a show of force and that decides whatever contest is at, at work there. Uh, usually, I would say in most cases, bluff wars are imposed between small groups of, uh, of individuals or, or people who are uh, in some ways independent, which is virtually no one nowadays. But in the past, bluffing wars would have happened between, say, Indian groups. One Indian group would pretend to attack another one uh, and then it would either scare them off or they would not They would stand their ground, and then that basically decides the conflict there. Now, expulsion wars, these are a little bit tricky because most, most of the wars uh, um, through, through recent times, at least from the uh, 19th century anyway, in most parts of the world, have been testing wars they've been fake or they have been real wars that have been lied about in some way so to reduce the impact of whatever that whatever's happening whatever the conflicts are whatever the sides and motivations are on the labor force right so the it's the need to know right you only need to know there's there's something going on over here and you don't really need to know anything beyond that and if you want to know anything beyond that well then they'll give you a nice a spun up story even though uh, the corporate structure system might not even know what's going on in that region, but they're still going to tell you some nonsense that keeps the labor force ignorant. But an expulsion war, it just like it says, is to expel someone or something. Most wars for independence are expulsion wars because if someone declares independence, such as with the Declaration of Independence of the United States, or at least the constitutional states of America, the the uh, colonies who were forging their own path, right, made the Declaration of Independence. The other side did not accept it. Thus, you have a war of expulsion to expel those who will not and refuse to accept the Declaration. If you're going to de declare independence uh, from the system, then you better be ready to expel the system, which is much easier said than done. Now, um, privilege wars, those have to do with someone who claims a certain right or a privilege in an area and the only way to decide that is through contest and that has there's so many different examples of this type of war between individuals and groups probably the most common historically would be the war over the right or privilege of the vatican to crown monarchs Right, we're mostly only ever taught about the nonsense of defined right of kings and blah 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 all that crap. 
But either way, a lot of wars and uh, the wars of religion specifically, they all revolved around the Vatican's meddling in the, pers in the political affairs of other states, of other places, and the fact that they would essentially worm their way in, just like with the uh, actually the, the war for independence of France had to do a lot with that because uh, as with Mazarin and Colbert and all of these other finance ministers and the actual practical heads of state, whereas the king was just a figurehead, well, those were all part of the Vatican's control structure, and we still see it today with the Universal Church. And so also the Vatican has engaged in wars with other groups in other places, all just about the right and privilege of even possessing territory, sovereign territory, in somebody else's location, which naturally, whenever the Vatican possesses sovereign territory somewhere, it means that that entire region has come into the fold and control of that global structure. However, the Vatican, of course, is just a finance mechanism of this global corporation, whereas, say, like the United Nations could be considered an operational head or, or central focal point, operationally. Of course, the United Nations and university systems and, the, and most of this stuff, which all goes back to Europe just about, as I say, all roads lead to Rome. Well, a lot of that, those are interconnected systems that all run based off of data metrics and they make strategies and they decide things based off those data metrics. And the, uh, a lot of people, I, I, I would say, I, even myself, I had an incorrect ass assessment of that particular, how that structure worked. Now, of course, you have completely fake wars and those happen either in some sort of fictional realm, like in a storybook, whatever. But it often happens and uh, reported as a real conflict, but it's really just done to write off uh, fake casualty numbers or, or launder funds or whatever, right? Just It's just completely fake, but it's designed for some other purpose. And then they make up a whole bunch of nonsense about it, but it never happened. And so, and also it could be because somebody doesn't want to lose their head, and so they just make up a war in a certain area, which apparently happened with the Osage Nation uh, when the Spanish occupied the, the uh, southern portion of the United States. And, uh, and they would have governors that would basically make up casualty reports and things like that uh, to uh, show, hide that... Um, there's no real conflict in that the person's not essentially handling the area like they were supposed to, even though what they were supposed to do was infeasible. Then you have intrusion wars, and that's basically the same idea as an invasion. But it doesn't have to be a physical invasion. It could be an intrusion into, say, some sort of social dynamic. Let's say you got two sides that are having the peace talks, essentially, either individuals, groups, right? you got gangs that are having peace talks, whatever, it doesn't matter. And... Um, some other person intrudes on that and attempts to get the uh, start hostilities again, whatever it is. Well, that intrusion could invoke essentially the idea of an intrusion war attacks and, and then conflict based off of that intrusion into the uh, whatever the social exchange was. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a full physical type of invasion or blockade or anything like that. And then you have legitimacy wars and that just like it, it, it talks about legitimacy war would be the idea of a conflict which is probably what we would have more than likely today so a lot of people think about the fact that we need to declare independence from a system which has become inimical to the people that's not right with the declaration of independence was already made to a system that was inimical to the people and that contest was won then a different organization pretty much run on uh, the exact same way as that old one, came in and pretended to be the structure that was there before. Thus, you have a war of legitimacy. It is not a war of expulsion at that point. It's a war of legitimacy because they have come in and taken over under false pretense. They're not the legitimate. And that's the same idea as somebody, a doppelganger, who takes over the throne and serves in the place of someone who has already died and continues to serve, and then somebody realizes that that person is not legitimate, and thus you have a war of legitimacy. Usually decided either when the legitimate uh, 
or illegitimate pretenders made legitimate just by basically uh, eliminating all opposition or they get eliminated and that's really the only way it's not essentially a total war because you're not trying to destroy everything you're simply a, a ju just trying to unseat the illegitimate pretender and the illegitimate pretender obviously is attempting to keep their position now when it comes to warfare legality or writing is a primary component that perhaps people know of less today but when it comes to a appropriate and, and uh, proper conduct and effective conduct even in individual warfare you need to have legal co the legal component done right and I mean done right in the context of operationalism not done right according to anybody specifically just you want your legal instruments to do their job to be effective that's what I mean by done right if they're not if they're not clear they're not concise they're not well made then you might as well not even bother it, it is important to have the legal paperwork component aspect which is the reason why you always have this stuff when it comes to war even though most of the uh, declarations of war have been for uh, testing wars or completely fake wars for uh, laundering money, resources, whatever. So, when you're doing this, let's say in the very real context, somebody de decides they're going to be in opposition to the system. Well, you can get a lot of things done in that context through paperwork. The first category of paperwork we're going to look at are declarations. You have a group in the United States called, um, well, they're, they're labeled sovereign citizens and also American nationals. And uh, a lot of times they're lumped together and sometimes they're separate. It, it doesn't really matter. You have a lot of groups out there. And a lot of the um, declared, right, here's, here's what we're talking about, declared by voice. A lot of the declared by voice heads and representatives of these groups, they all prescribe a declaration of independence. Well, what's that going to do? You, you always want to ask the question, what am I trying to get done with this paperwork? Well, most cases, if you did something like that, it would just get laughed at. However, other types of declarations will have some kind of impact. You might not actually like the impact, and so you should probably think about what the most likely consequence of making declarations is. It, you should never just declare something just because it feels right. You should probably think about it. I mean, it might feel right as well, right? You know, it might feel wrong to do, even though it makes sense, and maybe you just don't do it because it doesn't feel right, right? So there's different things like that. But if you if it's the right thing to do and you have to do it, then that's that's that. So, the first declaration is of no contest or of contest. In this context, if you get accused of something, you write a declaration of no contest, and you give it to them. If you're going to work in this, their system, then you're going to write something called an affidavit or some sort of sworn oath that you didn't do something. However, if you want to do it outside of their system, then you directly declare you were not involved in that contest. You were not involved in that activity. It doesn't matter what it is. You directly declare it, and the people can ignore it or whatever. It doesn't matter. You're, you're publicly declaring that you did not do it, or privately declaring. Either way, you're declaring it, you know. And that gives you a form with which you can base further actions off of. You, in good faith, declared you did not have an part in involvement, or, of course, that you're not going to take part or involve yourself in something. Uh, this could come in the context of say somebody comes along and they say I want to do this and if you write a letter declaring no contest you're letting them know you're not going to be involved if they go ahead with that that shows resolve so in in some cases you might want to do that especially if you're talking about um, you know because people can throw around promises willy-nilly but if you do these things in paperwork the paperwork holds weight because it shows resolve it has intention behind it Whereas you could write a letter of contest. So let's say you're dealing with some municipal thugs, sheriffs, police, 
doesn't matter what they call themselves. You can write them a letter of contest. And this would come in the form of they move against the property. They attempt to upseat, take someone out of their property that's your neighbor. You write a letter of contest. You send it to or deliver it to that person, individual, corporation, entity, whatever, however you do it. And you declare that if they move against that person, you will contest them. That is how you use a letter of contest. That will make them think twice about moving and all you did was write a letter. Usually, of course, you want to back it up because if you're bluffing and they realize you're bluffing, then that's going to be bad for future declarations with their, your, any future paperwork they'll just laugh at because you obviously showed yourself not to be a person of your word. You, If you're going to do this, then you should be a person of your word and they should expect actual contest back, backing that letter up. And if your letter carries that weight, then sometimes you can just uh, take care of the situation, especially if you do it right, with just a letter. You don't actually have to contest it because they won't push the, the situation. They won't, they, for fear of damaging the equity of the corporation, they won't do it. So letters of contest, especially today, can be very effective. Now the next one is a letter of no authority. This is really important because the word authority is thrown around a lot, usually and only ever in the context of the corporation, authorship of the corporation. However, you can, you can send this letter to somebody telling them that they are not included in the authorship outright altogether. An example of this is that in the U.S. Constitution, the only law enforcement mechanism in the Constitution are land, naval forces, and the militia. And the militia, according to the Second Amendment, are all those people that can keep and bear arms. Sheriffs, police, municipal corporation enforcement, police, uh, you know, uh, FEMA, feds, all of those different groups out there, none of them are in the authorship, in the, the authored work of the Constitution. And so anytime they do something, you can send them a letter of no authority. It could be something as simple as setting up road signs, of course, most of the time they might look at this and laugh, but if it's something particular, particular with especially like city councils and school councils, right, especially school councils, when they get somebody who is directly telling them they have no authority, well, they lose their minds. You know, they just go ballistic. So that's uh, you can get a, a nice rise out of those particular types of people and yank their chain by simply telling them they have no authority to do what they're doing. Of course, you have to word it the right way. You know, you don't want to just look like some uh, schmuck out there, which they always try to make fun of and uh, joke about people who do things like this. And then the third one is a letter of no right or declaration of no right. If somebody is authored in something or if somebody is, is engaged in something, but they're sort of outside the boundary of something or they're they're um, declaring a right or privilege they don't have, well, then you write them a letter stating they don't have that a declaration, they don't have that right or ability. Of course, it doesn't have to be a letter. It's a declaration, right? It could come in a spoken format, right? It doesn't have to be written. It, it could come in many different ways. You could tape a video, you know? And then uh, no legitimacy is the fourth decora declaration that's important for this video. If you declare no legitimacy, you're saying that that person might be included in the authorship. They might have a right to do something, but they're not the ones to be doing it. So let's say you get somebody who comes along and says, I have this title or whatever, and I'm going to do all this stuff. And then you get a letter of no legitimacy or declaration of no legitimacy that is telling them that they're not the ones to be doing it. They're not the legitimate role to do that. Yes, the right might be there. Yes, the authority, but they're not the legitimate ones. That's just like you might have a kingdom, which has a king, but then you have a pretender. They're not the legitimate king. Just because this place can have a king does not mean they can be the king, right? Just because some uh, schmuck wearing a white robe somewhere said that they're allowed to rule over this region does not mean that they're leg the legitimate ruler. So pretty much everything the Vatican does today as we all know, is, is no legitimacy. But of course, the questions are, what do you do about it? It comes down to the individual corporate components in 
your area. But of course, as soon as you make these declarations, like I said before, you get put on a list, you essentially be effectively become an outright opponent of them. And it's one side is, is gone or the other. That, that's it. That's what it comes down to. So uh, a uh, declaration is generally going to be short and long. So there's no real general length on these things. They could be really long or they could be really short. Right? It could be a single sentence or it could be a whole book, basically. It's um, really just up to uh, what's required and how, what the purpose of the declaration really is. How much information you need in there, how much evidence, all that stuff, what effect you want it to have. So it's usually um, in a written form, but it can be spoken. But either way, it is delivered in a firm tone. Declarations should be made with affirmation. Of course, that's a synonym for a declaration is an affirmation. It should be firm. There should be no room for argument or doubt or anything. It is a declaration. It is telling them something. So um, the next group of writings for the legal stuff, but which also could be delivered uh, verbally, these are going to be notices. First one is a notice of service. Most of us understand this in the context of the court. When you're serving papers to an opponent, you're actually doing a service for the court by doing that. You can serve, have a notice of service that is not only to the fraudulent equity courts that we call judicial courts today or courts of justice or whatever. You can serve the public in a service to the public by informing them of something, sending them a letter or uh, whatever, right? You're, you're performing a service. You could be doing service inside of a different corporation, a, a subset component of the main corporation, and you're serving that corporation, right? You could be serving a group, you could be serving whatever. Um, next one is a notice of action. Of course, that's detailing something that will be done, plans to be done, was done, or is being done, right? So what, anything that relates to an action being taken, a activity, a movement, you know. Uh, the, the next one would be to warn, to, to let uh, something of, of an impending event, something that's happening. It doesn't always have to be negative, even though warn has a negative connotation to it, or, or maybe not negative, but a, a bad connotation to it. So it, it could be um, warning of something that's uh, going to happen that's good, right? Like a, a warning notice of, of a fair, you know, that's, this is fair season now. So, you know, promotions could be considered warning notices. Uh, then there's a notice to clear something up. Say there's a doubt somewhere. There's a, um, a, a misunderstanding. Well, then you send a notice to clear it up. Now, these are going to be generally short, one to two pages. Uh, they can be found in a variety of tones, right? You could have uh, a tone of uh, immediacy. You could have a tone of, like, uh, you could have a... a a attention-getting tone, especially with promotion, things like that. So th those are your notices. And then the last category are going to be reports. And reports generally are used differently from notices and declarations. Notices is just it, it, to, to give notice, to, to uh, let someone know. You know, uh, declarations are the same, uh, similar. But reports are have to do with analysis. It's it's a package of information. It's uh, usually going to be really long, like writing a book. It's going to need to be detailed, but it's usually going to be done in a sort of level tone, not um, not overly uh, with the intent of having the other person understand and comprehend what's going on there. And you know, you would have. Naturally, these are most known in the context of militaries, where you have uh, 
subset components which are writing reports to commanders and the commander needs to know what's going on in order to make decisions. That's what a report is. It's not just a notice. It's not just declaration. It's something intended to have a little bit more information behind it. So uh, the first one is a report on activities. These could be a report on your own activities. It could be a report on someone else's activities. It's going to relate to all sorts of details on activities uh, of, of what's being used, what's being done, where it's being done, you know, the, the uh, who, what, when, where, why, how, that type of thing. Uh, the next one will be uh, capabilities, uh, what you can do or what someone else can do, what, what your knowledge base is, what training you had, what resources you have at your disposal, all of these things come into capabilities. So that would be a separate type of report on activities. Or in some cases, you could have a single report that incorporates all of these reports, and so these are like subset reports. But anyway, these are the ideas and categories that are important to this idea in conduct in warfare, especially when it relates to dealing with this corporate structure that's inimical to individual, uh, well, individual anything, really. Uh, vulnerabilities is going to be our next one, and um, naturally those could be yours as well as someone else's. And then report on the situation. Situation reports or sit reps in the military are very common, and they can incorporate all sorts of, they could be really short. A simple um, sit rep done over the radio is going to be a lot shorter than a situation report done in a by uh, some sort of intelligence analyst or whatever in an office building who is compiling a very detailed uh, book, basically, to be read about the situation on an entire region. So, um, some of these can be mixed together. You know, it, within the reports themselves, like I said, you could have an o uh, overall report that includes all of those report types. You could have a declaration, which is unlikely, but you could have a direct declaration that has all of these in them. You know, you could write a very long declaration, which declares no contest or contest. So here's an example, right? If, if you're writing a thing to these thugs in law enforcement, so-called law enforcement, and you want your letter to have the most impact, well, then you're going to do a very thorough job to make sure that they know that they're dealing with somebody who will do their homework, who's capable and in a problem, a real problem. Not somebody who's just going to go out half cocked, but somebody who's going to be a real issue for them. You know, they don't want to mess with you. You would, first of all, declare no authority. Then you would declare no right or no, and then you, you might declare no legitimacy as well. You, you know, you might declare no authority or no right. You know, you could declare no authority and no legitimacy. You know, it could be just whatever. And then you declare no contest. That's a little bit different from the cease and desist idea where you tell somebody to stop doing something uh, and the consequences of if they continue to do it, usually kept vague. And that's attorneys generally write those as like a, just legal letters. You know, there's a whole structure and system they use in their corporate concept. Well, this is uh, sort of however you want to design it because this is not running on their system. The intent is that you deliver it to the individual organizational mechanism or to the individuals in the area, right? If you think this isn't going to do anything, then you can send this around into the area and hope that maybe it gets back to that person or that it rallies support. You can send this to neighbors, okay? If you have a neighbor who's being harassed, you can send this around to their neighbors and say, and put in that report a declaration of contest stating to the individuals in that area that you are going to back up this person if they decide to stand their ground against it and that, you know, by sending that declaration you're hoping others might declare the same. It's sort of like when you're farming for allies, you've declared your support for one side and you're hoping that that will garner support from other people because they want to be on the winning side, essentially. So, um, that's just a general overview of a very complicated, uh, or it doesn't have to be complicated, but uh, these concepts are um, definitely important to know if you're going to try and actually fix anything. Now the next and last part will be the patterns and symbols that relate to this topic. The first one is that of Paul Revere. Paul Revere is a legend of uh, the Midnight Ride of Paul Revere from the 
Declaration of Independence or War for Independence era of the uh, con continental or constitutional states of America. And uh, the logical conclusion is that the rallying of troops to oppose the um, the imposition, the intrusion, not, well, not the intrusion, the uh, crackdown, as it were, from the, uh, at that point, had been official authorities. Well, that was done through the plane of Reveille, which is why it's played off on military bases all, all across the nation and the country. It is not the same one used by the British because unlike what we're taught in our phony corporate school structure, or illegitimate corporate school structure, in some cases not really phony, um, the Reveille, the, or the French impact, in fact, I would say more than likely people mostly spoke French uh, up until even the uh, late 19th century. French was considered the more sophisticated language to speak, and so most people would speak French. So uh, Reveille is, of course, the music used to wake up troops on uh, U.S. military bases. And there's uh, waking up rituals in nearly every culture, and uh, it's it would make sense that a military waking up ritual with a bugle would be used in the War for Independence area, considering most that uh, were in the population at that time and had fought in the French and Indian Wars. They were veterans. It would be essentially the same idea as uh, as we saw during COVID times, a whole boatload of veterans get cast out into the population and then they just decide to essentially form their own independent force. That's how you would look at the War for Independence. They did not fight in uniforms. There was no Continental Army. There was none of that stuff. These were simply veterans that all got together and formed the militia. So uh, the next pattern we'll look at is Black Rock. Of course, we know nowadays Black Rock is, is a, a term used by the for the major corporate investment structure of Black Rock and Vanguard. You have a lot of places, of course, called Black Rock and other insignificances, but it relates to Pompeii. Pompeii is the only place on Earth in which an entire city was cast in stone from a volcanic eruption. That virtually has happened nowhere else across the planet. Although I'm sure there's a, if I am so important as to have propagandists to counter what I say, I'm sure they'll come up with all sort of fake excuses for why that's not true. However, that's not the point of this, is that it, is that the black rock is volcanic stone. And what happened at Pompeii relates heavily to the Medusa story of the Gorgon, a, a snake-headed woman with the capability to turn people to stone. All of those things correlate together. It's sort of a coalescing pattern that when you look at the pattern, you understand uh, at least somewhat of what's, what's going on. there. Now the next one is fire. Fire as a concept is a central role, not just with the Jesuit order and uh, and uh, the sun, sun worship, all that stuff, which of course worship would probably just mean study, or, or there's reverence and, and things like that, you know, which isn't study, it's, it's just a ritualized reverence for something. But a fire has a particular position, and that comes with uh, the uh, rain dances of American Indians, in which they would make rain essentially by building giant bonfires. Now, that's always taught as some superstition of old the past culture and that uh, it should be guarded but it's false basically it's based off of myth and things nonsense it's not though because the more smoke you put the smoke is the more natural form of cloud seeding but you wouldn't want people doing that if you're trying to control the weather because everything's part of the corporation right so you want to dissuade that then you have beacons right the lighting of the beacons from lord of the rings where that was a central component of their signaling system. So lighting beacons, that's been an old form to signal, uh, which then, of course, you had Reveille and Bugle playing, and now you have other different ways to signal people, and you, of course, have the app signal, you know. Um, and, of course, you have Flame of the West was the name for the sword that was carried by uh, Aragorn. So 
the, the flame does not always have to have a bad connotation. It has particular significances to it. And of course, smoke makes clouds, which makes rain. You know, in the school system, they in science class, they had this uh, experiment where you would, it's not really an experiment, but it's just like a showy thing, where you would capture smoke in a bottle and it would make condensation. But then you also have lighthouses. Now the next thing is oriflamme. What they say in the official context is the name for the sacred banner of the king of France or whatever nonsense. But the idea of a flame being a banner or a streamer makes a lot of sense because if you think about a whole group of cavalry with banners on their their spears, it's going to look like fire, right? Fire going in a certain direction or say like the tail of a comet. So there's a, a pattern of similarity there. And then, of course, you have Lord of Light from uh, Game of Thrones. And they have burial rituals where they burn the bodies. And then the Zoroastrians and the Hindu practice of for the dead in, like, say, Delhi and India, all of those have revolve a lot around the use of fire and flames and bonfires and torches and things like that. So there's a lot of stuff around fire that most of us don't understand or know about because we've been schooled not to because it's not really necessary for the production value of the labor force. The labor force is supposed to only focus on producing or be distracted by sports or some other nonsense. Of course, burning effigies, uh, we don't, nobody does that really very much anymore, but that used to be a common practice, not just burning the little dolls, which they always equate to witchcraft or voodoo, but, you know, you've got the burning of the... Uh, um, well, you have the burning of effigies during the War of Independence, but you also, of course, have it, uh, uh, the Guy Fox thing, you know, uh, 5th of November thing they do in England. And then uh, in the TV show Stargate, there's uh, the Ori, a race of sentient uh, creatures or whatever that um, look on, well, they're not creatures, that in the TV show they essentially had humans that would look on the so-called flame of origin, and then they would become these drones of the system and so that's something that has to do with the idea of origin and fire and the flame and all of these things relate to a different understanding of what the bible it's specifically is actually talking about anyway thank you hope you enjoyed this video and uh i have clarified some points and perhaps been taught something useful or shared something useful so uh Stay tuned for the next one. Thanks.